if you don't like jazz. Metal Gear Solid is an incredibly important series to me. They started out as these fun games with interesting writing, incredible levels of polish, super unique gameplay, and lots of fun fourth wall breaks, but they've become so much more for me. As I dug deeper into the series, I actually managed to find something like an identity for myself in these games. From the moment I started this channel over four years ago, I knew that someday I would do a video on Metal Gear Solid 2. It was a super important game to me, and I was essentially just waiting until I had gotten good enough at making these videos that I was ready, worthy of making that video. Well, eventually I did. I spent several months working on the script, whereas I usually only took a few days back then. I played through the game countless times, practically memorizing every single codec call and cutscene, and it all led to what I still think is one of the best videos on this channel, even as my editing, writing, and production quality has gotten significantly better over the years. But that's not what's so important about that video to me. What's important about that video is this line. Metal Gear Solid 2 is incredibly important to me, and as a result, I'm going to talk about myself in this outro more than I typically do on this channel. To people who have seen enough of my videos, that line probably sounds ridiculous. These videos are very clearly just as much about myself as they are the topics I'm covering. That's what makes my channel unique, and at times, alienating, but it's what the channel is, and this video is when it became that. This video, or more specifically Metal Gear Solid 2 itself, is what made my channel this way. And considering that this channel is almost definitely the biggest footprint I'll ever leave in this life, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that this series helped me define my life. I'll put this out there right now. While we're going to be covering the vast majority of Metal Gear lore, this is not a lore video by any means. Rather than just looking at lore, we're pretty much just going to be looking at these games the same way that your English teacher wanted you to look at Siddhartha. I've made a standalone video on almost every Metal Gear Solid game that Kojima directed. Some of those videos I think are fantastic, others feel a little bit pointless. Here's the thing though, while I'm super proud of videos like these three and think that they can stand on their own without relying on each other to fill in the gaps, Metal Gear Solid as a whole is about much more than the games are individually. The series is so much more than the sum of its parts. Metal Gear is a story about love and deterrence and life and family, sure, but beyond even that, it's a story about art and thought and emotion and feeling, and at the very bottom of the rabbit hole, Metal Gear is a series about <laughs> existence. As I was writing this, I was looking at a 25,000 word script for a whole series analysis on Metal Gear. I wrote it about two years ago, and I've been sitting on it ever since. Committing to a single video that's several hours long isn't really financially or creatively viable for me, so I've decided to split this up into multiple parts. Ultimately, if you watch these videos in order, you'll understand a story that goes so far beyond the Snake family, and so far beyond the literal narrative of the games. This is going to be one big story cut up into five parts, not five separate stories. Anyways, this is the Metal Gear Solid 1 part of the story. Metal Gear has followed a whole lot of traditions throughout its development. It can be something as iconic as using a box to hide from enemies, to something as subtle as the player always heading north as they complete their objectives, to something as memorable as the series' bleeding heart view of nuclear armament, to something as random as claymores becoming invisible after they've planted. These games are really connected in their ideas and themes, so to get a better idea of where it all started, where all these ideas were fathered from, we need to look at Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. We won't spend too much time here, because there isn't much to talk about that we won't be covering in the rest of the series. More than anything, I just want to establish now to unfamiliar players that these games do exist. Just like Metal Gear Solid, they have the corny boss fights and cartoony stealth and the preachy, heavy-handed monologue about war and the nature of soldiers. Lore-wise, all we really need to know is that this soldier named Big Boss created a mercenary nation called Outer Heaven because he was tired of being left without a purpose for existing after his war ended, and wanted to essentially create a military-industrial complex so that he and other washed-up soldiers in the world could have a purpose again. Solid Snake infiltrates Outer Heaven, kills Big Boss, destroys a weapon called Metal Gear, and makes it out alive. Then, in the second game, the exact same thing happens. A soldier named Big Boss creates a mercenary nation, Solid Snake takes him down, yada yada yada, only this time, Outer Heaven is called Zanzibar Land. 
like I said, I won't be getting too into those two games here in the beginning, but we're going to see a whole lot of references to these games over the course of the series, both blatant and extremely subtle. So, again, just know that they exist. Now, Metal Gear Solid 1. Much like Metal Gear 2 was basically a reimagining of Metal Gear 1, Metal Gear Solid 1 is a reimagining of Metal Gear 2, only this time with advanced 3D graphics, high quality voice acting, and state of the art cutscenes. We've got the inexplicably invisible claymores, we've got bombs planted in our inventory, we've got fistfights with Frank Yeager, aka Grey Fox, aka Cyborg Ninja, we've got betrayals and weapons R&D scientists teaching us about robots, we've got Snake getting more powerful with each boss he kills, fights against tanks and high Ds, we've got the same pistol, SMG grenade stinger, RC missile, landmine, weapon set, it even gets as specific as having two towers towards the northern end of the facility, with a scene where guards chase us up seemingly endless stairs, and another where your female companion is taken down when you attempt to cross a long, linear path in a way that blocks you from progressing, forcing you to backtrack for an item so that you can get past the new obstacle. I could go on and on, but you get the point. The similarities between these games are uncanny, and very deliberate. So why? Why use all of this exciting new technology to essentially just tell the same type of story you already told twice by this point? Well, in reality, it's probably just that Kojima liked the concept and wanted to do as much with it as possible, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. At least, I feel like it does. To start off, let's talk about what Metal Gear Solid 1 is really all about. It's a lot easier to pin down than the other games in the series. Basically, it's about genes, and what they mean to creatures as complicated as humans. From the very beginning, we have Kazuhira Miller telling us about how Alaskan field mice eat the offspring of other Alaskan field mice in order to ensure that their own genes live on. We have Dr. Naomi Hunter constantly talking about the Human Genome Project and her motivations in becoming a geneticist, and how she feels that she can determine who she is and what she should be doing with her life if only she could crack her own genetic code. Then we've got the late game reveal that Solid Snake, Liquid Snake, and every single one of these genome soldiers was essentially made with Big Boss's DNA. Solid and Liquid are pretty much clones of Big Boss, and the genome soldiers have had extensive gene therapy exposing them to over 40 soldier genes that Big Boss carried. You've got Psycho Mantis talking about his rocky relationship with his father being the reason for his hatred of humanity, the fox dye virus specifically becoming lethal in people who have the genetic patterns it was programmed to attack, and tons, tons more. Hell, the last thing we see before Snake rides off into the sunset is a caribou with its child. Genes are absolutely everywhere in this game. So, okay, these are all things that are relevant to the gene discussion, but what does the game actually have to say about any of this stuff? Well, basically, the game is about learning not to obsess over your genes. I mean, think about it. The antagonist of the game, Liquid Snake, is doing everything he can to surpass his father out of hatred for both his supposedly cursed genes and the world that his father's generation left behind. Solid Snake, on the other hand, doesn't even know for sure that Big Boss was his father until the end of the game. I don't have any family. No. Wait. There was a man who said he was my father. He doesn't obsess over his genes like Liquid does, and so he doesn't feel as if he's been cursed since birth. Liquid keeps saying that he only exists because he was necessary to adopt all of the recessive genes so that Solid Snake could get all of the dominant genes and be the superior clone. But as Ocelot reveals in the post credit scene, Liquid was in fact the dominant clone, but Solid Snake beat him in the end anyways. Turns out your genes don't determine your fate. This is a concept that carries over to almost every character in the game. Otacon's greatest mistake was following his father and his grandfather's legacy of creating weapons. Meryl tries to become a soldier so that she can understand her father better, ultimately realizing that she isn't cut out for this stuff. We'll get back to that when we talk about MGS4. All of Psycho Mantis's trauma stems from his childhood fear of his abusive father, but in his final moments he learns that he shouldn't have allowed his father's cruelty to warp his perception of humanity. Sniper Wolf obsesses over her past, seeking revenge on the world after the death of her father figure, Big Boss. Naomi becomes a biologist specifically so that she could understand herself by learning of her family history, only to learn that her non-biological relationship with Grey Fox was more important in the end. Vulcan Raven spends all of his screen time talking about the culture and history of his people, ultimately to fall, just as Liquid did. 
Hell, Mei Ling is only kind of a character in this game, but even she introduces herself by talking about her Chinese-American heritage, and how she's reconciled it by reading plenty of literature from both America and China. Above all else, though, every single one of the soldiers we see in this game was injected with Big Boss's DNA, and so, because they were essentially created out of an obsession over genes, they're all bound to succumb to Fox Die. So what exactly is Fox Die? Well, it turns out that Snake was infected by Naomi with a virus called Fox Die, which was made specifically to target the genetic code of the terrorists and a couple of other key players, and cause their hearts to fail. This was done so that Metal Gear could be retrieved safely without having to nuke Shadow Moses. But think about that again. It's a disease that specifically knows who to kill by seeking their genetic code, their genes, doomed to die because of what they were born as. In the first truly abstract moment in the Metal Gear series, Snake isn't killed by Fox Die. We're told that he has the exact same genetic code as Liquid Snake, and he was exposed to Fox Die hours before Liquid was, but Fox Die kills Liquid and seemingly doesn't have any effect on Snake. Naomi, by this point in the game, realizes that her genes don't determine who she is. She was, in her own words, looking for a reason to live through her genes, rather than just living. And that's the advice she gives to Snake. Snake asks her how long it's going to take for him to be killed by Fox Die, and rather than giving him a straight answer, she tells him to just live. Snake doesn't need to worry about Fox Die, about his genes. He needs to just be. He needs to live in the moment instead of focusing on his past and his inception. He needs to move past his own generational trauma, lest he succumb to the same fate that every other character obsessed with their heritage was doomed to. The lesson of Metal Gear Solid 1 is to not let your past define you. You need to live in the moment and know yourself for who you are, not who you were or where you came from. That obsession with the past leads to you getting nowhere in life. It leads to you being defeated by your recessive twin and killed by your own genes. Not yet, Snake! It's not over yet! This is Metal Gear, however, and you can't spell Metal Gear without meta. This is not where I move on to MGS2 just yet. A lot of people don't like Kojima's self-destructive motifs. Plenty of lifetime Metal Gear fans hate on MGS4 and V for coming across as so cynical towards the series, while others say that that's the whole point of those games. I say something a little bit different, but we'll save that for later. People say that that angle is just an excuse that Kojima superfans make up to excuse him losing passion for the series. I'll be real, the final years of the Metal Gear series do tend to leave a bad taste in my mouth too, but Kojima's examination of the fact that the series was getting, well, repetitive has been around for as long as Metal Gear Solid has, and it didn't always take such a self-destructive form. That critical examination of the Metal Gear formula has always been there, but back then it was done through a much more hopeful lens. I introduced Metal Gear Solid 1 by saying that it felt like it was more of a reimagining of Metal Gear 2 than a wholly original game. You've got very similar game mechanics, with very similar gameplay and pop progression, very similar set pieces and boss fights and so forth, only in 3D this time. Like I just said, however, Metal Gear Solid is a series all about learning to not obsess over your past and to not let your past define you, but that's exactly what Metal Gear Solid did. It let itself be defined by what Metal Gear already was. Well, with Metal Gear 2 being a game that feels more like a definitive version of Metal Gear 1 than its own game, and Metal Gear Solid feeling more like a remake of Metal Gear 2, I would imagine that any creator, Kojima included, would have wanted to move on to some other series by now. And that's exactly what Metal Gear Solid is all about, from this meta perspective at least. It seems to me like it's Kojima saying, and what he thought would be his last Metal Gear game, I'm not going to let my most successful game so far define me. I'm going to move on and create another great thing, rather than more of the previous great thing. Only, well, he wouldn't get to move on to a new series for about 20 years with Death Stranding. Kojima, much like Liquid, Mantis, Raven, Wolf, Ocelot, Naomi, Otacon, Meryl, the Genome Soldiers, Mei Ling, would be doomed to being defined by his past up until the series' brutal, unceremonious ending in 2015, when he finally got to move on to something new. I'll see you all up ahead in the next video, where we'll be talking about one of my favorite games of all time, Metal Gear Solid 2.